Now, I want you to think about this. I open with a text of Paul to the Romans. Hope doesn't disappoint because hope is the gushing forth of God's love. The Holy Spirit gushes forth God's love into our hearts. So all the love that I have is because of the Holy Spirit. Paul encounters a group of people in, in, in Ephesians 19, or, or Acts 19, that are Ephesus disciples. Something about them doesn't set right. So Paul goes, hey, tell me about your conversion experience. What about the Holy Spirit? And they go, well, I don't know what the Holy Spirit is. And he goes, you can't go one more day without knowing the Holy Spirit. He goes, you need to know the Holy Spirit. He says, so tell me, how did you even come in? And where they came in was through a performance-based ministry. And he goes, okay, we got to start over. I want to immerse you in the Holy Spirit. The physical manifestation of that was tongues and prophecy. And Paul starts a church in Acts chapter 19 and Acts chapter 20 in Ephesus. He even has his first pastor's conference in Acts 20 in Ephesus, where he teaches them what he calls the whole counsel of God. And then years later, he writes a letter to them called Ephesians. And in that letter, he says to them, here's what I've been praying for you ever since we met. I've been praying that you guys would comprehend what happened to you the day by that river. When I dunked you down into the water and you came up full of the Holy Spirit, don't misplace what the Holy Spirit is here to do. The Holy Spirit is not about what he can get you to say. The Holy Spirit is not about what he, the emotion he can get you to feel. The Holy Spirit is not simply about the power attached to knowing the Holy Spirit. He said the Holy Spirit is so that you will comprehend, that you will lay hold of, and that you'll be rooted and grounded in the height, the depth, the width, and the length of the love that surpasses your ability to understand. He said, and if you could get that, he goes, then you would be filled with the fullness of God. Then you would understand what it truly means to be his children. And then the Bible progresses onward, and we roll into the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, John, most likely the same John that wrote our verse we read earlier in 1 John 3, 1, what manner of love is this? What out of this world love is this that the Father calls his children of God? That John, who most likely ran in the circles of that apostle Paul who founded that church at Ephesus, hears Jesus speak to him to write a letter to the seven churches of Asia. And he says, in that first letter, you're going to write to the church at Ephesus. And the important part when you read the seven letters to the churches at Asia is to realize that Jesus is the one talking, standing in the middle of seven golden candlesticks. And seven golden candlesticks in Revelation chapter 1, he tells us, are the seven churches. So where is Jesus in relation to his church? Always standing in the center. No matter which church you read in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus is standing in the center. Even the church at Laodicea, we love to act like Jesus is outside that church knocking on the door wishing to get in. He's using an allegory of what it would mean to sit down at the dinner table with him. But according to Revelation 1, he's in the middle of Laodicea because there's nowhere else for Jesus to be in his church but in the middle, even when his church doesn't look good. Let me say that again. There is nowhere else for Jesus to be in his people but in the middle, even when we don't look good. Even when you have a bad week, where does Jesus hang out? In his church. Not in this building, but in that building, and in this building. And every one of the seven churches at Asia get a blessing. Every one of them, he says, I know your work's doing a good job. Even ones that are doing a terrible job, he compliments them. Because they're his. They're his kids. But listen to his letter to the church at Ephesus. Remember, this is our, this is our Acts 19 group. This is our Ephesians 3 group. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the middle of his church, his seven golden lampstands. I know your works and your labor and your patience, and I know that you cannot bear those who are evil. I think this is a message that all of us could agree with if we stopped right here. We're doing the best we can. Our works, our labor, our patience, and we don't like to hang out with those that are evil. And you've tested those who say they're apostles and they're not. You found them liars. Oh, man, this, this is good. This feels good for Jesus to be saying this to us. Look at how astute we are. Look how close we are to the truth. You've persevered. You have patience. You've labored for my name's sake, and you've not become weary. Praise God. But we should probably stop right there. That should be the end of the Sunday morning sermon. Because all of that's good news. Everything that we just said is good news, except for verse 4 is in your Bible. And he says this, nevertheless, I have this against you. 
that you've left your first love. Now, I've heard it said that Jesus cannot have anything against you because he has paid for everything at the cross. But I want to present to you something that is in your New Testament. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, Jesus, not on an individual basis, but on a corporate basis, he's saying to his church, I have something against you, church. Now, he doesn't start with that. He starts with, good job. You guys are doing a great job, man. You're spotting truth. You don't hang out with the evil. Proud of you. You're persevering in tough times. Way to go. But I have something against you. And what I have against you is you've left your first love. Now, this is the church at Ephesus. This is the same church that Paul baptized in the Holy Spirit so they would know the love of God. This is the same church that Paul prayed and said, I bow, my right knee. I bow on my knee so that you would comprehend the height, the depth, the width, the length, and the love of God so that you'd be rooted and grounded in us. You'd be full of the fullness of God. And yet, by the end of the Bible, they've left their first love. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, else I'm going to come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent, the lampstand was the light, the minister, the pastoral leadership of one, each of those churches. And so the rebuke by Jesus is not to Ephesus. Man, if you don't get this right, you're going to burn in a devil's hell. No. His rebuke to Ephesus is, look, you're only going to walk in the light of revelation for so long if you walk away from the thing that saved you and that is the height, width, length, and depth of the love of God. If you leave that foundation, the lampstand that lights the darkness in your life is gone. We cannot walk in the progressive revelation we all so desire when we leave that first fruits of knowing how loved we are and then in return loving the world around us. Remember from where you've fallen and repent. That's change your mind. Change your mind back to the comprehension of the love of your Father and who God is and how much He loves you. And so I don't know how you're going to do it in your day-to-day -day life, but I think all of us need a progressive Progressive repentance, a progressive changing of our mind. Father, I'm having a hard time loving so and so, and I'm having a hard time loving that idea, and I'm having a hard time loving that group of people, and I'm having a hard time loving that. And it's a lot easier to just talk about them. And it's a lot easier to get around my friends that also don't like them, and all of us talk about them. That's a lot of fun. It's a lot easier for me to just get in a group where it's a safe spot for me to say what I want to, and then we can just talk trash about the people that we disagree with and then we'll be fine. And now some people in grace go, we don't need these kind of sermons in grace. And I'm here to tell you, we need them more now than we've ever needed them before because we need a restoration of the love of the Father in our hearts and in our lives. More than ever before, my prayer for you, church, is that you comprehend the height and the width and the depth and the length of the love of God. Do you leave today going, gosh, I don't really know if I comprehend that? Good. Good. I hope you leave today going, I don't know if I really comprehend that. Because that's our journey. That's what we get to do. Discover that love.